is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Juvenile Bureau. A pair of fake talent scouts are at work in your city. They're victims, young girls seeking careers in Hollywood. The criminals are rel- vicious and relentless. Your job, get them. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end... From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, May 7th. It was mild in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Inspector Bowling, Commander Juvenile Division. My name's Friday. It was 10, 13 a.m. when I got to 1335 Georgia Street, second floor. The squad room. Hi. Hi, Ben. Did you pick up that latest run the stats office made for? No, I don't think they got it ready yet. Notice there in the book, it's been ready since yesterday. You were over there, you could have picked it up. Well, yeah. What's the matter with you this morning? Don't you feel good? No, just this stinking cold seems to be settling in my chest. It's miserable. Yes, sir? Can I help you? Oh, yes. I'd like some information, please. This is the juvenile bureau, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, sir. What can we do for you? Oh, Mind if I sit down? I'm climbing those stairs. Takes your breath away. Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thank you. My name's Wayne Kenworthy. The officers are out here on a convention. My home is in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Went out last night with some of the boys at the convention. We stopped at a bar down on your Alvarado Street. Oh, Alvarado. Yeah, Alvarado. Anyway, we were drinking there, and the bartender got to talking to us. Finally offered us some pictures for sale. I got one of them right here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you are. I paid him $2 for it. Just look at that. Yeah. Phil. Do you have the address of the bar where you bought this? Yes, sir, I have. But that's not the reason I'm here, though. I'm not a one-man moral squad. I'm not the type that makes a habit of buying obscene photographs of young girls, either. Yes, yeah, sir, we understand I bought this picture from that bartender because I know the young girl in it. She's the daughter of one of my neighbors back home in Minnesota. Known her ever since she was a baby. This girl came out here about eight months ago to live with a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She was crazy for Hollywood. Thought she might break into the movies or something. She stopped writing her folks about two months ago. Hasn't been heard from since. Well, it sounds like a case for a missing persons bureau, Mr. Kenway. Well, the girl's folks have already contacted them. Nothing's been turned up. Nothing at all. Then... Last night, just by an accident, the bartender shows me this photograph. It's that girl, all right, no mistake. Mm. Well, we'll do everything we can to help straighten it out, sir. Well, that young girl I know. I've known her since she was a baby. Good family, good training. She never would have posed for a photograph like this. Rotten filth. She's just not the type, that's all. Yes, sir, we understand. What was this young girl's name, Mr. Kenworthy? Lois Brewster, that's her real name. When she wrote her folks, she was using another name while she was out here. Thought it might help her movie chances. Drake, I think that's what it was. Linda Drake? Yeah, that's right. About uh, five foot four, 
115 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes. That's right. Yeah. You know where she is? Well, yeah, we do. We had her case called to our attention. Hmm. Where is she? Is she all right? No, sir. She's dead. Two days before Mr. Kenworthy walked into Juvenile Bureau, the body of a young girl had been washed up on the shore just below the beach town of Venice. Apparently, she'd taken her own life. The girl was a brunette, attractive, not more than 17 years old. There was no identification on the body except for a rent receipt found in one of the pockets of a cotton jacket that the girl had been wearing. The rent receipt was made out to Linda Drake. It was signed R.L. King, 876 Peoria Avenue. The address was checked out, and R.L. King was found to be the girl's landlady. After identifying the body, she told investigating officers that Lois Brewster, alias Linda Drake, had lived at her rooming house with a girlfriend for about six months. The girlfriend's name was Joyce Fowler. The landlady went on to explain that the two girls had moved out about a week before without leaving a forwarding address. The Fowler girl had said that she would call back for any mail that might be delivered to the Peoria Avenue address. There had been no other leads to the dead girl's background or identity until her former neighbor from Minnesota, Mr. Wayne Kenworthy, showed up. Later that day, Ben and I met with Inspector Bowling and briefed him. Dirty, rotten business. I'll buy that. How far have you gotten with it? Check the dead girl's quince with the missing persons, both and Miss Lois Brewster. We notified the girl's parents in Minnesota. They're coming out to claim the body. It's pretty tragic. She's an only daughter. Seventeen years old. Same old story we figure, Skipper. Some phony talent scout grabbed her and showed her the bright lights, got her to pose for those pictures one way or another. They can make a teenage girl go one of a hundred directions after that. Ah, this one ended up on a beach. That's all I care about now. How about the girlfriend Lois Brewster was living with? Joyce Fowler? No, no word so far. Mm. Well, what about it? Any ideas? Well, it pretty much depends on finding this Joyce Fowler. There's no background on her. We got out on all points. How about phony talent scouts? Cheap modeling schools, photographers? Check out that angle. We put four of them away in the past six months. Another half dozen are being watched. We can start double-checking them tomorrow. Now, how about that picture that old fellow Kenworthy brought in? Any lead there? We gathered a dozen samples just like it. One's as bad as the other. They're all printed on the same quality photographic paper. There's no markings of any kind on them. It's a common type of paper. All right, then get on the distribution angle. Stay on it. Every rotten bum that peddles this trash, get them. I want them right up the line. Distributors, wholesalers, guy that prints the pictures, guy that takes them, every lousy one of them. I still can't figure. What's that? Well, the Brewster girl is a good home there, good training. She knew right from wrong. Kids don't forget that in a hurry. That might have been her trouble. How do you mean? She remembered it. Wednesday, May 8th, six teams of men from Juvenile Division working in conjunction with the Detective Bureau started the drive against the obscene literature and photography traffic. Within two weeks, more than a dozen wholesalers, distributors, and small-time peddlers had been apprehended and were awaiting prosecution. But we still had failed to uncover any new leads in the Lois Brewster case. The roommate, Joyce Fowler, the all-important witness in the case, was still missing. No trace of her. The dead girl's parents arrived in the city, claimed the body, and took it back to Minnesota for burial. The drive continued. Another week passed. On May 29th, on a tip from a usually reliable informant, Ben and I checked out a small photographic studio on Sunset Boulevard, operated by an Emil Joseph Martin. He was sullen and uncooperative. We checked through his files. Just what I told you. A few special shots I keep filed away just for that. Uh-huh. Once in a while, a friend drops in. I print one of them up for him. Yeah. Hold that one up to the light. Some of them are nice-looking dolls, huh? I print one up for my friends once in a while. What kind of friends do you have? What? How about this negative here, Martin? Do you mind printing this one up for us now? Sure, officer. My compliments. How many copies you want? One's enough. If you say so. Let's see. Uh-huh. One of the best. I'll print it up right now. This way. This one's a real collector's item, you know. Yeah, right. A friend of mine got me the negative. A hundred bucks it cost me. Worth it, though. I'll make up a couple of pence for you, huh? One's good. Okay, anything you say. You want to get that light switch? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, beautiful. 
clue, Nigger. Yeah. You picked a girl, all right. Yeah. Get the paper in here. Okay, one print. That's all you want? That's all. Okay, let's put it in the soup. Yeah, I bet you get a kick out of this one. Real beautiful girl. How'd you happen to get a hold of this negative? Did you take the picture? No, a friend of mine got it for me. He cost me a C note. There we go. Put it in the stubber. There we go. Uh-huh. How about that? How about the guy you got this negative from? Did he take the picture? No, he bought it from somebody else. Don't know who. Cost him 350 Worth it, though, huh? We've seen her before. Oh, that's so, you know her? Only from her pictures. Oh. Of course, you understand I didn't take the picture. I just bought a negative, that's all. You couldn't tag me for that, could you? We're going to try, mister. Get your coat. Oh, no. Wait a minute, now, officers. I'm small fry in this operation. You know that. You want the big fish, right? We want all of you. You know who they are? Well, some, maybe. Must be worth something to you. Well, you know better than that, Martin. If you cooperate, we'll mention it in our report. That's all we can do. No promises. Not a very good offer. You're not in a very good position. Yeah. All right, I'll buy it. All right, I'll tell you. Emil J. Martin was booked at city jail for violation of 311 PC. His file of lewd photographs and negatives were impounded and booked as evidence. With the help of information which the suspect had given us, we were able to round up three wholesalers and another distributor of obscene books and photographs. Each one of them was questioned thoroughly. We ran into the same old routine. They denied knowing anything about the man who was masterminding a racket or where he was operating from. The Lois Brewster case dragged on. No progress. In virtually every case of tracing the lube pictures to the point of production, the investigating officers were able to link the small-time peddlers to their distributor and the distributor to the wholesaler. And that's where it stopped. A dead end. Beyond that... Nobody knew anything about the operation of the racket. Stakeouts were set up at locations where sales and deliveries of obscene material were known to have been made. Nothing happened. The drive stalled. Thursday, June 11th. Camaro? Joe? Yes, Gibber? First piece of news in the month. Policewoman just called it in. Yeah? Lois Brewster's girlfriend, Joyce Fowler? Yeah? She's been found. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke long cigarettes, give the best of long cigarettes. Give king-size Fatima. You see, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild, and superbly blended to give smokers a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes, rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality, even to the appearance of the distinctive royal blue Fatima gift carton. Christmas wrapped and carefully sealed to ensure Fatima's rich, fresh, Extra mild flavor. Remember, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. So this Christmas, give your friends the best. Give Fatima the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Like most organized crime, the traffic in obscene literature and photographs is a racket jealously guarded because of its heavy profit. It's nationwide, and every year it nets millions of dollars for underworld promoters and their employees. As an organized business, it's one of the most vicious and insidious rackets that exists today, despite the fact that many citizens regard it lightly. Thursday, June 11th, 10 a.m., 
Ben and I met with policewoman Paula Johnson. She told us that the previous evening, Joyce Fowler, the girl Lois Brewster had been living with, had gotten into a brawl with an unidentified man at a bar on Sunset Boulevard. Police officers arriving at the scene identified her as the missing girl and handed her over to juvenile authorities. At 10.30 a.m., Joyce Fowler was brought to the interrogation room. She was a tall brunette, fairly attractive. She looked older than her age. Together with policewoman Paula Johnson, Ben and I questioned her. I was out on a date with this man. We were sitting at the bar, and he started saying things I didn't like. What a row, that's all. The man seemed quite a bit older than you, Joyce. Was he a good friend of yours? A friend. He was about 50, I guess. I thought he was all right. He wasn't. How old are you, Joyce? 21. We've checked your background, Joyce. You might as well tell the truth. All right, I'm 17. I'll be 18 next week. Look, can't I go get an aspirin? I've got a terrible headache. I got some in my locker. Be right back. Okay. I still don't know why I'm here. What do you want to know? Well, you were a good friend of Lois Brewster's. You lived with her. Is that right? Is that why I'm here? It's one of the reasons. Lois spent eight months out here before her death. As far as these officers know, you lived with her during those eight months. We want to find out what happened to her. We want to find out what's happening to you. Nothing's happening to me. I can take care of myself. That's what Lois Brewster thought, Joy. How about her? You tell us? She didn't know what she was doing. I don't know what happened to her. I'm to blame for bringing her out here, but it's not my fault what happened to her. It's not my fault. Well, whose fault is it? All of them. The whole rotten, dirty bunch of them. Here's your aspirin. Are you sure I'm Thanks. I'll get some more. Don't you feel well? I'll be all right. All right, here you are. Thanks. I don't remember too well how it started. Lois came out to Hollywood to live with me for six months, you know. Yeah, we know. We tried to get modeling jobs, bit parts in the movies. We didn't have much luck. We had to eat, pay the rent. So we took jobs as waitresses at a drive-in place out on Santa Monica Boulevard. Are you still working there? No, we were only there two weeks, and we got this other job. That's when it started. What was that? One day, these two men drove in with a brand-new Cadillac, ordered a couple of Cokes. I could tell they were watching us, Lois and me. When they were leaving, they gave me a card. They said they were talent scouts. They asked us to come to their offices for interviews. You still have the card they gave you? No, I looked for it once. Guess I lost it. Mm-hmm. Would you go on, please? The older fellow's name was Fred Ramos. Other one was Mr. Gilbert. They were both very nice. We didn't think anything was wrong. Didn't you go for the interview? Yes, Lois and I both went. They talked to us a lot, had us read out of a script, walk up and down. They said both of us showed a lot of promise. They said they wanted to be our agents, so we signed a paper. Fred Ramos told us he'd see we got a break. Mm-hmm. Did either of them ever arrange any legitimate interviews for you? I mean, with the movie studios, radio, television, anything like that? No. They took us out quite a bit, restaurants, nightclubs. Told us we had to be seen around town first. Had to show us off to the producers, all the important movie people. Both of them were very nice. And did you keep on working at the drive-in? No, they had me and Lois quit the job. They said it wouldn't look right. We still had to eat. We still had to pay our rent. That's when they brought up the idea of the pictures. What pictures do you mean, Joyce? I'm sorry, could I have some more water, please? Oh, yeah? Fred Ramos and Mr. Gilbert took us out to a big nightclub one night. Fred told us that if Lois and I had some good pictures taken of ourselves, he could show them around and get us jobs as models. That is, till we got a break in the movies. Here you are. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Up to that time, how long had you known these two men? About, about a month and a half. I didn't see anything wrong in it, so Lois and I went to this photographer's studio with Mr. Ramos, and we had our portraits taken, regular pictures. Well, excuse me, Joyce. Did both of these men know how old your girls were? We told them the truth. We were both 17. Mm-hmm. Well, what happened after that? Mr. Ramos came back and said he'd found an advertising agency that wanted to buy pictures of Lois and me. He said we'd get $20 a piece every time we posed. For her portraits? No, for posing in bathing suits, pajamas, things like that. They were supposed to be for magazine ads. 
In about a week, he brought us to his office and said the agency wanted us to pose without clothes, without anything. He said he'd pay us $40 for that. Well, go on, George. They showed us lots of pictures of models like that. They talked about it all the time. We kept saying no, both of us, Lois and I. Did you ever agree to pose for the kind of pictures they wanted? You can't agree to something you don't know about. I don't know how it happened, but it did. Mr. Gilbert and Fred Remus, they kept taking us out. We used to drink quite a bit with them. Went on for weeks, I guess. One night there was a big party. We drank. Lois and I got separated. I still don't know what happened. I see. Next morning, we both woke up with headaches. Fred Ramos came and showed us the pictures. I felt dirty all over. I don't know how it happened, I swear it. Lois began to cry. I hit Mr. Ramos. I slapped him. And when does Mr. Ramos tell you? He pretended to be very nice about it. Said he'd pay us well if we'd go on posing for pictures. The kind he wanted. If we didn't, he said he'd wreck any chance we might have in Hollywood. Said he'd see that the pictures got out. Threatened to send copies to our families, our friends back home. Didn't you think of going to the police? We talked about it. We were afraid of the publicity, the newspapers. We just kept going on, doing what he said. It was like a nightmare. Kept getting worse, we kept getting in deeper. There, didn't you have that envelope? Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you recognize these pictures, Joyce? Yes. Mr. Ramos and Mr. Gilbert, they have you posed for these? Yes, that's some of them. We always drank a lot so we wouldn't remember. That's that's not why Lois is dead, though. Those pictures aren't the reason. Well, how do you mean, Joyce? Ramos and Gilbert, they'd fix up dates for us. They said the men were their friends. Three or four times a week they'd call. We had to go out with them. We had to do what they said. Hmm. One morning we got home about 5.30 in the morning. Lois changed, said she was going for a walk. I went to bed. She left a note. I never saw her again. Mm -hmm. I see. Romero? Oh, yeah, just a minute. That long-distance call we placed to your home, Joy. You're right. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah, it's me, Joyce. Yeah, it was just a mistake. Yeah. How's Uncle Henry? It's well. No, no, it's all right. Don't you worry. Yeah, all right. I'll write you tomorrow. Yeah, bye. Thanks for placing the call, Sergeant. You're welcome. Glad to do it. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, there's just one more thing. Do you still have that note that Lois Brewster wrote before she died? No, I lost it. I remember what it said, though. Yeah. It said, I'm sorry. It was signed Lois. That's all. Joyce Fowler supplied us with the addresses of Fred Ramos and his partner, Gilbert. She gave us all the names and addresses of all their friends and employees that she knew of. She also pointed out their offices and base of operations. Inspector Bowling ordered an immediate investigation into the background and business activities of both men. Previously convicted wholesalers and distributors of obscene photographs were called back in and re-questioned. We finally completed the missing link in the supply line from the peddler to the producer. Five former workers for Ramos and Gilbert fingered them as head men controlling the racket. Their offices and studios were raided and their files seized as evidence. On June 18th, Fred Ramos and his partner, Harold Gilbert, were placed under arrest. What's the pitch, Sergeant? What's this all about? I think you know, Mr. Ramos. Oh, you can't tag me on those pictures. You want to get your hat? It's artwork, legitimate artwork. My lawyer can prove that. He better be good. I can bet he is. You know, I'm kind of surprised at you cops taking a word of somebody like that Fowler girl. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's a psycho. Is that right? Why, well, sure. I, I tried to do something with her and that girlfriend of hers. I even signed up as her agent. They, they were hopeless. You've got quite a stack of negatives here. Pictures of both of them, 17-year-olds. Ah, they're just candid shots, you know. Spicy for my private collection. There's nothing wrong in that. I figured I'd give the girls a break, let them earn a few bucks. Yeah. Look, I couldn't have treated those girls better. I took them around, showed them the town. Both psychos. I never did trust them. Well, that's the big difference, Remus. Huh? They trusted you. Fred Ramos and Harold Gilbert were brought downtown to Inspector Bowling's office. Joyce Fowler was seated next to the desk. Gilbert was brought in. She identified him. He was taken out and held for booking. All right, bring in the next one. 
All right, come on. Yeah. Can you identify this man, Miss Fowler? Yes. He's Fred Ramos. What's the trouble, Joyce? Weren't you satisfied with what I was paying you? Could have settled this between ourselves. If you had any beef, you could have come to me. You're lucky, Fred. I'd kill you now if I could. Oh, Joyce, oh, come on now. Crazy. Sit down. All right, Sloan, take him out. Joyce, sit down. Come on, sit down. Be back in a minute, Joe. All right. I'm sorry. Doesn't do any good. Are there any more? No, that's about all. You've helped quite a lot. Yeah, I'm glad I could do it. Is that all, Sergeant? Well, for now, yeah. You'll have to testify at the trial. After that, the juvenile court's going to keep in pretty close touch with you. I see. Aren't you going back home, Joyce, to Minnesota? No, it'd be the same old thing. My aunt'd be glad to see me for the first week. Then she'd start all over again, hollering at me, picking. Wouldn't be any use. What are you going to do out here, Joyce, you know? I know a nice fellow in Santa Monica. He's going to get me a job at a brand-new drive-in. Cute uniforms. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think juvenile court's going to let you take a job like that, Joyce. Well, I hope so. A lot of talent scouts go there. Radio, movie producers. They might notice me. Yeah. Never can tell. Might lead to something. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. To get year-round thanks for the gift that you give this Christmas, why not give Fatimas to every long cigarette smoker on your list? Their first pack of extra-mile Fatimas will have them convinced, like I am, that in Fatima, the difference is quality. And Christmas Fatimas come in a distinctive royal blue slip-over jacket that makes a perfect gift just as is. Remember... Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Give Fatimas, the quality king-size cigarette, to every long cigarette smoker. Fred Ramos and Harold Gilbert were tried and convicted on several counts of rape and lewd conduct. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. This is Bob Hope. Can we steal a second? Chesterfield, Chesterfield, always wins first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. Don't forget to give Crosby for Christmas. I mean the Chesterfield Christmas carton with Bing as Papa Santa Claus. See you Tuesday. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Coming up, We the People, with stories of today on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all, long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. You've been tracking a hold-up man for months. You finally get a line on where he's hiding. You know he's dangerous, well-armed. Your job, get him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. 
And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, March 18th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We are working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Ed Walker. My name's Friday. It was 9.48 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, you ready to go? Yeah, we're going to hustle. Here's your top coat, Joe. Oh, thank you, Ben. Uh, where's Tom? We can pick him up down the hall. He's checking out some tear gas shells. Might need him. How Please. about the address? You confirm it? 2100 Buchanan Avenue. It's a corner house. Skipper? You know what to expect when you get out there. Don't take any chances. He's alone in the house, all right? Supposed to be? Yeah, that won't give you much of a break. How do you mean? He's heavy on guns. Two revolvers and a hunting rifle. Yeah. He's not shy about using them. Don't forget it. Right, Ed. Slack, Ben. Let's go. Okay. It's been a long haul. Yeah, I hope this washes it up. Hunting rifle, couple of revolvers. What do you think, Joe? Well, 18 robberies in three months. You know the guy as well as I do. Yeah. What's your guess? His name was Hoffman, George R. In our files, his criminal record dated back to high school days. Petty theft. Grand theft, auto, burglary, armed robbery. His record included two terms at Preston Reformatory and one at San Quentin. Hoffman's latest campaign was a three-month run of armed robberies. We tried everything we knew to stop him, but it wasn't enough. We'd failed to get a line on him until one of Captain Walker's informants came up with a tip that Hoffman had been hiding out for the past month in a small bungalow on the corner of Buchanan Avenue and Selma Street. According to the information, the suspect had a good supply of food, ammunition, and three guns. 10.15 10.15 p.m., together with Sergeants Tom Gaffney and Slats Henry, Ben and I parked our car down the street and started toward the house. It was foggy. The street was poorly lighted. As we approached the house, we could see a light burning in one of the rooms at the rear of the bungalow. The light in the back room, George, just went out. Yeah. Slats, yeah. you and Tom want to cover the back? Right. Let's go, Tom. Be careful. Yeah. All right, Ben. Easy, huh? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, Joe. Hmm? Curtains in that corner room. I thought I saw a move. Ah, get out! Come on, Ben. The front door. Yeah, come on. Come on, hit it. Yeah. Come on, hit it again. Yeah, all right. Come on. They got it blocked or something. Something piled against. Come on, once more. There we go. Watch the furniture, Joe. Yeah. That front room's clear. Yo! In the back! Come on. Went out the side window. Where'd he go? Across the street. Got him pinned down behind that car there. He's in the car. All right, let's go for the tires. All right, Hoffman. Give it up. Cover this end, Slats. Right. Ben, that hedge across the street, you see it? Yeah, okay. All right, let's run for it. Come on, huh? You okay, Joe? Yeah. Hoffman, you haven't got a chance. Throw out your guns. Okay, Ben, give it back, Joe. All right, all right. I'm coming out. Throw out your guns. Throw them in the street. Here they are. All right, get out of the car. Hands behind your head. All right, hands behind your back now. Slats! Yeah? You want to get our car? Right, Joe. 
Who told you? Who gave you the tip? Does it matter? I made it easy enough for you. Lousy car wouldn't start. I'd be three miles away if it would have started. Better call the tow truck, huh, Joe? Let me give it a look, huh? Lousy luck, that's all it is. What was wrong with it, Joe? I tried it. It wouldn't start for me. He should have turned on the ignition. George Hoffman was taken downtown and booked on suspicion of robbery. At a special show-up, he was identified by more than a dozen of his robbery victims. Between his arraignments and his preliminary hearings, we worked together with the district attorney's office in lining up witnesses and preparing the evidence against the suspect. We figured we had an airtight case. Hoffman's trial in Superior Court was set for May 14th. Hi, Joe. Hi, Slats. What's doing? You still arraigning, Hoffman? Yeah, this trial's coming up. Hey, hmm? what happened to your eye? Yeah, how about that? I'll never live with that now. Yeah, come here, let's see. This real black guy I ever had. Had him bruised plenty. They hurt, you know? Yeah, how'd that happen? Well, every week, Gaffney and I go up to the neighborhood boys' club after work to help coach the kids at sports, you know? Mm hmm. Well, last week we had boxing lessons. Yeah. I was coaching this one youngster. He turned out to be a lot quicker than I thought. You're really connected. Mm -hmm. I guess everybody in the building's heard the story, huh? Yeah, just about. Gaffney took care of that. Captain called me in this morning, asked me if I wanted to file assault charges against the kid. Some joke. Mm -hmm. Never fails. You still coaching the kids up there? No, not this week. Kids are supposed to get lessons in wrestling. I'm not taking any chances. Yeah? They've been watching television for months. I'll see you later, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nice, Lance. Nice. Hi, right, man. How you doing? Pretty good. Put your coat on, Joe. Yeah? What's the matter? George Hoffman. Yeah? Just broke jail. The morning of his escape, Hoffman was scheduled to appear in Superior Court for arraignment. According to routine, he was taken from his county jail cell on the 12th floor of the Hall of Justice and escorted to the jail shower room on the 14th floor. There he was to take a bath changed to his civilian clothes for his appearance in court. While he was in the shower room, he turned on the hot water faucets, filling the room with steam to hide his actions from the guard. He succeeded in forcing his way out through one of the windows, climbed up one story to the roof. Realizing that he couldn't escape down through the building, he lowered himself over the ledge of the roof and using the narrow crevices between the bricks to hold on, he climbed seven stories down the outside of the building. At the eighth floor, he found an open window and got inside. He slugged the bailiff who tried to stop him and then ran down the remaining flights of stairs into the street and disappeared in the crowd. Twenty minutes later, he robbed a dentist's office at 3rd and Los Angeles streets and got away. Police and sheriff's deputies covered the city for him. Ben and I were among them. 11.55 p.m., we checked back in with Captain Ed Walker. You want to cut that speaker, Ben? Yeah. Nothing. Not a trace of him. He must have a good friend someplace in town. Everything's covered. His friends, relatives, his hideout, everyone he knows, every place he's ever been. We've plugged every loophole we can think of. The depots, terminals, the airports, still no trace of him. Well, I don't know. It sure is a strange one. No stranger than climbing down the side of a building. Did you check that story out, Ed? It's the truth. Apparently, Hoffman planned the thing out pretty carefully. How do you mean? The sheriff's men talked to some of the prisoners in the jail. They said Hoffman was practicing for it since the day we put him in there. Yeah. He'd work out five to six hours every night building up his hands and fingers. How'd he do that? Use the upper bunk in his cell, hang from the edge of it with the tips of his fingers. He'd do it for hours, pulling his body up and down. Made little grooves in the wall, dug his fingertips into them. Prisoners say he got so he could hold himself up like that ten minutes at a stretch. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. How about the bailiff he slugged? He'll be all right. A couple of bad bumps on the head, that's all. Robbery, Walker. Oh, yeah, little John. I sent him out about ten minutes ago to relieve you. Yeah, they ought to be there pretty soon. Right. How about our schedule, Ed? 
As far as I know, we're going all night on this thing. Sheriff's office is the same. Mm-hmm. You two were relieved at 11.30. Better check back about 5.30 a.m. Okay. Right. That's a hot shot. I got it. What is it? Drugstore holdup. They think it's Hoffman. The scene of the holdup was the Rex Lake Pharmacy on the corner of Pico Boulevard and Pine Lake Street. The victim, a Mr. Clarence Geringer, told us that the holdup man had entered through a rear door slugged him and escaped on foot with his overcoat and about $150 in cash. We showed him a number of mug shots. He identified George Hoffman as the bandit. A special detail of men were ordered on a thorough search of the general area around the drugstore. No sign of the suspect. The citywide dragnet continued all that night and into the next day. No developments. The search went on. A week passed. Two weeks. At 10 p.m. on the day Hoffman was scheduled to be tried in Superior Court, he beat up and robbed a 40-year-old liquor salesman in the Highland Park area. Again, he made good his escape. Routine investigation failed to turn up a single lead. June 8th, the suspect was still at large. The legwork continued. 817, is that the address you got? Yeah, he said it was near the corner. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. The Townsend Hobby Shop. Yeah, let's go in. Mm -hmm. Joe, look at the electric trains. Look at that one. Beautiful layout, huh? Mm-hmm. I guess that's all they handle in here, electric trains, huh? There must be money in it. Look at those signals there and switches. They're all automatic. wonder if my boy's old enough for a train yet. There must be the manager over there. Come on. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, excuse me, sir. Just a moment, please. Be right with you. You've got to check this transformer. All right. Huh? Automatic coupling on the tanker car looked out of kilter. No mistake. No? Well, let's see, Jim. <laughs> yep, she's a dandy, isn't she? Sure is. Uh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. Have to keep up our maintenance on the rolling stock. Uh, what can I do for you? Police officers, we're looking for a Mr. Townsend. Oh, yes, I'm Roy Townsend. Are you the sergeant I talked with on the phone? Yes, sir, that's right. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. Hi, Mr. Townsend. Uh, you mentioned that you might have some information for us. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I may have. About that uh, fellow who climbed out and escaped. Uh, oh, it was in all the papers. George Hoffman. Uh, Hoffman, Hoffman, that's it. Uh, I'm a pretty good one for faces. I think I might have seen him last night. Where was that? On my way home from the meeting, I belong to a model train club. Don't get enough of it here every day. Yes, sir. We'd like to know about this man that you saw. As I say, I saw him going into the auto court just down the street from where Mother and I live. It was pretty late, after midnight. Where do you live, Mr. Townsend? Over by Pasadena, Royal Oaks Avenue. I know Mrs. Cox at the auto court very well. I see. Well, this man that you saw last night, you sure it was Hoffman? I saw his picture in the paper when he climbed down and escaped. Uh, I don't say I'm positive it was him, but I'm good on faces. Well, uh... I wonder if you'd mind checking through these pictures. Oh, no, not at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, this one. He's the one I saw. Am I right? That's Hoffman. Do you happen to know if he's staying there at that auto court? Oh, yes. He's been there for a month. Say, Sergeant, if you find out it really is this Hoffman, don't tell Mrs. Cox at the auto court. It'll just break her heart. Oh, is that so? She's sort of an amateur detective. She thinks she knows faces better than I do. After we left the train shop, we called the office and filled them in. Captain Walker called Pasadena and notified them. Then we drove out to the auto court where the suspect was reportedly seen. Yes, you want something? Yeah, are you Mrs. Cox? Yes, I'm the manager here. If you want lodgings, we're filled up. You might try the Golden Eagle straight down the street there. Police officers, Mrs. Cox, do you have a Mr. Hoffman staying here? Hoffman? No, I don't. Got a half buyer, though. You sure that's not it? Well, uh, would you look at this picture, ma'am? Recognize it? Yes, but his name's not Hoffman. It's Kane. Number 23. He's not in, though. Left this morning. Oh, is that so? Yes, won't be back for another hour. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke long cigarettes, give the best of long cigarettes 
give king size Fatima. You see, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended, to give smokers a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes, rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality. Even to the appearance of the distinctive royal blue Fatima gift carton. Christmas wrapped and carefully sealed to ensure Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Remember, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. So this Christmas, give your friends the best. Give Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Before going on stake out at the auto court where George Hoffman was registered, Ben put in a call to the office. The owner of the court, Mrs. Cox, gave us a pass key to Cotty's number 23 where the suspect was staying. We advised her to say nothing to Hoffman when he returned. We went to Cottage 23 and waited. An hour passed. Hoffman failed to show. Another hour went by. Still no sign of him. Well, what do you think? Oh, you got me. I don't know. We're in an hour overdue. No chance he could have been tipped. Well, I don't see how. Mrs. Cox is the only one who knows we're here. There's no reason for her to warn him. I don't know. His things are all here. His clothes. Well, we've had longer waits than this. Relax, huh? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Can you see who it is? Man, coming from next door. Joe? Okay, I'll cover you. Open it. Oh, your new telephone directory? Oh, yeah, thanks. Anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong, thanks. New phone book. Yeah. We waited another hour. George Hoffman still had failed to appear. At 4 that afternoon, we checked with the office. No word. At 5.30, we were still waiting. I was just thinking, Joe. Yeah? That fellow Townsend in the train shop. That sure must be a dandy hobby, electric train. Yeah, it runs into money, though, doesn't it? Well, I think I'll talk to the wife about it. Their education, you know. My boy sure get a kick out of having his own train. He's pretty young, isn't he? Three years old. Well, I could show him how to work it, put things together for him. I'll get it. All right. Yeah? Oh, yeah, Lightning. Oh, uh, when? Okay, thanks. What's doing? Skipper just got a call from Pasadena. Yeah? They picked up Hoffman ten minutes ago. The suspect, George Hoffman, was taken back to Los Angeles and lodged in county jail. This time, there was no escape. At his superior court trial on August 16th, he was convicted on several counts of armed robbery and sentenced to the state penitentiary. From August to January of the following year, the months went fast. We washed up a string of liquor store holdups just before Christmas, got two days off. My Uncle George and Aunt Allen came down from Renton, Washington, to visit with my mother during the holidays. In January, Ben was off work for a week with a bad dose of flu. Another five months went by. Toward the end of June, we got word that George Hoffman was no longer at the state penitentiary. After serving 11 months, the former holdup man had been paroled into the Army with a provision that he serve overseas. Another three weeks passed. July 12th, Tuesday, Ben and I had lunch at Koken's Cafe and checked back in at the office. I wish Koken would change his menus a little oftener. Fried beans and pastrami sandwiches. Seems to have the same thing every time. Well, you sure dug into them. I got the idea that you like them. Oh, I like them all right. I just eat too much, that's all. Three sandwiches, two plates of beans. No wonder I never ate dinner. Dan? Joe? Yeah. You two back from lunch? I want to grab a sandwich. Yeah, go ahead, Slash. We can cover. Okay, thanks. Sarah, sure, there's somebody waiting in the next room for you. He wants to see you. Okay, see you later. Right. Want to see who it is, Joe? I'll check the book. Yeah, all right, fine. Yes, sir, my name's Friday. You want to see me? Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. Remember me? George Hoffman? Oh, yeah, Hoffman. The Army uniform there. I didn't recognize you. Yeah, I thought it might fool you. I guess you heard about me. Good break, huh? I'm glad you feel that way. How you doing with the Army, huh? Pretty good. I like it. That's fine. 
Just thought I'd drop up and see you, fellas. Uh, you still that partner you had? What's his name? Uh, Rod Griegas? Romero. Yeah, yeah, we still work uh, together. Yeah, Romero. I knew it was some kind of name like that. Yeah, well, come on in, Hoffman. Oh, thanks. Hey, Ben. George Hoffman here. He stopped in to see us. Oh, yeah. Hi. Been a long time, Hoffman. How are you? Pretty good, Sergeant. Thanks. Uh, just thought I'd stop by, you know. Sure there's no hard feelings? Oh, sure thing. You got any idea when you're going overseas? Oh, boys in my outfit figured day after tomorrow. That's kind of one reason why I dropped in to see you. Well, how's that? Well, I, I know it's pretty nervy, but I got lots of that. You see, uh, a bunch of us are on leave till tomorrow noon. Figured we'd go out tonight, and I'm a little short. You know how the Army pays. Okay, well, how about a couple of bucks, George? Will that do you any good? <laughs> yeah. Sure as swell you, Sergeant. Believe me, I'll see you get it back. Well, here's a couple more, Hoffman. Might help out. Well, it's no use telling you how much I appreciate it. I, I give you my word, I won't forget it. I'm going to pay this money back to you. Oh, forget it, George. We're glad to help you out. Well, thanks again for the touch, huh? Sure nice of you. Okay. Now, drop a card if you get a chance. I'd like to hear how you're doing over there. Sure thing. See you later, huh? Right. Good luck to you, boy. Well, looks like a turn for the better anyway, huh? Mm-hmm. But it was my last two bucks, doggone it. It never failed. Well, we had to give him something. Yeah, but what do I do for lunch money tomorrow? p.m. we drove out to the Wilshire district to interview a robbery victim. We brought him back downtown and took his statement. 4.30 p.m. we checked back in with Captain Walker. Hi, Skipper. Henry says that ex-con George Hoffman was in today. Yeah. We talked to him. Yeah, that's right, Ed. Why? Have a look. Thanks. The MPs left about 20 minutes ago. Swell. Your two bucks went for nothing, Ben. Hoffman's wanted. Huh? Broke out of Army prison 10 o'clock this morning. Together with the Army authorities, local officers joined in the citywide search for George Hoffman. At 10 o'clock that night, a food market on Santa Fe and Rialto was robbed and the proprietor beaten. From our mug shots, the victim identified Hoffman as the holdup man. Shortly after midnight, a drugstore on Crenshaw was held up. Hoffman was again tabbed as the suspect. The next two days, the search was intensified. No leads. Two more days went by. Late Saturday morning, we got a hurry-up call from the detail on duty at the Union Station. Hoffman had been reported in the vicinity. Ben and I drove down to the depot to check with the officer in charge, Slats Henry. Spot him, Joe? No, let's have a look back by the ticket counters, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he is over by the phone booth. Come on. Hi, Slats. Hi, looks pretty good. What's the story? One of the newsboys up the street gave us a tip. About an hour ago, a guy gave him a dollar to come down here and buy a ticket for him. Ticket to Phoenix. Yeah? Kid came in, bought the ticket, went back up the street and gave it to the man. Mm-hmm. We showed the kid a bunch of mug shots. He picked out Hoffman's. Yeah. He's not wearing his army uniform, huh? No. Brown suit, dark blue overcoat, no hat. That's what the kid told us. Any idea which train he was taking for Phoenix? Not exactly. He asked when the first train for Phoenix was. The newsboy told him 3.35. Mm-hmm. Ten minutes to 12 now. You got enough men to handle it, Slats? Everything's covered. Only one thing lacking. Yeah? Hoffman. While the stakeout continued on the Union Station, Ben and I, together with Gaffney and Henry from Robbery, covered the bars, restaurants, and hotels in the immediate area for a sign of the suspect. 2.30 p.m. What do you think? Well, we better head back down for the station and see what's doing, huh? You're okay. I'd like to have a dime for every mile we have logged on this case. Yeah. Joe, hmm? Have a look. Where? Across the street, dark blue overcoat. Same build as Hoffman. I'll bet on him. Come on. He spotted us. Yeah, that's Hoffman. Come on. Come on pick it up. Yeah. I lost him, Joe. Where'd he go? Turn down first street. Come on, hurry up. Across the street, Ben. Yeah, watch the traffic. Where'd he go? I see him. That antique store on the corner. He ran in there. Come on. Yeah. There he is. All right, Hoffman. Out of the way, mister. All right, hold it right there, Hoffman. I'm coming out. Move. Watch it, Joe. I said I'm coming out. You hear me? You're going the hard way, George. Come on. Drop it. Drop it. Oh, 
All right, Hoffman. All right, on your feet. Come on, get up. Yeah. Now get your hands behind you. Sure. What good's it gonna do you? All right, mister, let's go. What good's it gonna do? I already proved it. I can break jail any time. I proved it twice. You're going right back in again. What's that prove? <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 8th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. To get year-round thanks for the gift you give this Christmas, give Fatimas to every long cigarette smoker on your list. Their first pack of extra mild Fatimas will have them convinced, like I am, that in Fatima, the difference is quality. And Christmas Fatimas come in a distinctive royal blue slip-over jacket that makes a perfect gift just as is. Remember, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Give Fatimas the quality king-size cigarette to every long cigarette smoker. George R. Hoffman was tried and convicted on several counts of robbery and received a life sentence as a hardened criminal. After serving ten months of his sentence, Hoffman attempted an escape and failed. A few weeks later, he took his own life in his prison cell by hanging. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, in answer to your requests, Dragnet will repeat A Gun for Christmas, the actual case history broadcast last year during the Yuletide season. That's next Thursday, December 21st. <laughs> have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. This is Bob Hope. Can we steal a second? Chesterfield, Chesterfield, always win first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. Don't forget to give Crosby for Christmas. I mean the Chesterfield Christmas carton with Bing as Papa Santa Claus. See you Tuesday. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. We the People is next with more good times on NBC. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A small boy is reported missing from his home. His age, nine years. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima... The difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet. 
the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, December 22nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working a night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.55 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Ben? Well, here's the file on the Webster case. And all the follow-ups been made? Yeah. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This Levinson unit, 113J. Got something for you. Yeah, Harry, what's doing? Uh, Doherty and I are out here on Collins Avenue, 4656. Trying to track down a nine-year-old boy. Yeah, what's the story? The kid's missing, suspicion of foul play. Well, how long's he been gone? About two hours. Looks like a job for homicide. Well, how do you figure? The kid was last seen playing in the backyard of his home. Yeah? We checked over the yard. Did you find anything? Blood stains, lots of them. They look new. <laughs> Ben and I left a message for Chief of Detective Thad Brown. Then we went over to the crime lab and picked up Lieutenant Lee Jones and drove out the Arroyo Seco Freeway to Collis Avenue. It was an average neighborhood. Number 4656 was a one-story green stucco residence situated on the corner of Collis Avenue and Harrison Drive. Beyond the backyard was a tract of undeveloped land covered with scrub oak. Harry Levinson from Highland Park Juvenile was waiting for us in front of the house. Back this way, fellas. Coming, Lee. Hey, I get my bag. Uh, who notified you that the boy was missing, Harry? The mother said she went out to do some Christmas shopping about 11 this morning, left the boy home. Mm-hmm. She came back about 2 this afternoon, he was gone. What's the name? Johnstone. The kid's name is Stanley, 9 years old. Mm-hmm. Was this gate open like this when you got here? Yeah, I haven't touched a thing. Uh, I hear the stains over here, Lieutenant Jones, along the edge of the walk. See? Yeah. Well, let me see. Yeah, quite a few stains, huh? Yeah. Looks like it might be blood. Try some benzidine on them. There we are. See what happened. Where's the kid's mother now, Harry? Yeah, in the house. Doherty's talking to her. Did you talk to any of the neighbors? People next door are the ones on this side. They couldn't tell us anything. There it is, fellas. Yeah, Lee. These spots I covered with benzidine, they're turning blue. Blood stains, all right. Can't say definitely whether it's human or animal blood. Mm-hmm. Do you have to go back to the lab to run it through? Yeah, a biological precipitant test. Hand me one of those glass files from my bike, will you? Yeah, sure. Okay, here you go. Hey. Scrape some flakes off the test. There we are. How soon can you tap the blood for us, Lee? Precipitant test won't run more than 20 minutes. It'll take three or four hours to run a blood grouping, though. That's it. Anything else you want to check? Levinson? Anything else? Uh, yeah, uh, right here in my handkerchief. Empty shell. That marker over there by the rosebush? That's where I found it. From a 22, huh? Yeah, might tie in, might not. Mark it and dump it in this envelope, will you? Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Did you get out a missing broadcast on the boy here? Uh, Doherty did about a half an hour ago. Here's a description here. Thank you. My mother know about the blood stain? No, we didn't tell her. She's worried enough already. And she has no idea what might have happened to her boy, huh? No more than we do. She checked all her friends and relatives. We're covering the neighborhood. No trace so far. Not much to go on. Blood stains. Empty cartridge. Yeah, it could mean a hundred things. Any ideas, Friday? Just one, and I don't like it. p.m. Thursday, December 22nd. The neighborhood search for nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone continued. Lee Jones went back to the crime lab to start the precipitant test in the blood grouping. Levinson and his partner, Doherty, from Highland Juvenile, stood by. We called Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, and he ordered up a special detail to aid in the search for the missing boy. Ben and I questioned the boy's mother, Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early 40s. She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Miss Johnson, is your boy Stanley in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. Well, when was the last time, Miss Johnson? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, ma'am, I'm not married. Well, there comes a time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home, go out on his own. 
Usually happens somewhere around 8 to 10. I think I know what you mean. I have a boy. Well, then you know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one afternoon after school, and he was quite put out about it. Thought George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. Well, how long was he gone? Oh, no time at all. About two hours. I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone. Said every boy had to go through that stage. Mm -hmm. Well, then you think that he's run away from home again this time? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now, and I have a funny feeling about it. Did you and his father have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? That's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you now that we're talking about it. I, I am getting worried. Well, is there any place around that he might like to visit? A hobby shop, playground, someplace he might be? Yes, there's Jensen's model shop, little Shannon Burroughs, but I've already called there and he hasn't been seen all day. I've called all his friends and they have no idea where he is either. Well, we'd like a list of all of his friends and the places that he was known to frequent. Yes, all right, I'll give them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where's your husband now, Miss Johnson? At work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. What house is he staking there? Engine Company 12. He's working the A platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him Stanley's gone. Well, is there any chance the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No, he seldom goes down there anymore. No, I don't think he's there. Uh, I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Well, certainly. Go right ahead. I know George will be worried. Engine Company 12, please. Stanley's been gone too long. Hello? May I please speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. Oh, I hate to call George at his work. Yes, ma'am. Uh, does your husband own a gun? Yes, he does. What caliber do you know? Well, it's a 45 automatic. He got a knife. Uh, George, this is Ruth. Uh, George, is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh. No, I can't find him anywhere. He wasn't here when I came home from doing my shopping. There are two policemen here. No, I said there are two policemen here. No, dear, I'll call you if we don't find him soon. All right, dear. Yes, you too. Goodbye. I didn't think he'd be with George. At 45, is that the only gun in the household? Yes. Why are you asking about guns? Has anything happened that you're not telling me about? No, ma'am, just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that forty-five, if you don't mind. Maybe I should tell you we do have another gun in the house, but it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. What if we could see it, please? Yes, well, will you have to unwrap it? Yes, ma'am, I think so. It's in the closet. I think I can reach it. We had to hide it. Let me see. Well... There's a paper it was wrapped in, and Stanley must have found it. It's gone. You see, here's the gift card and the box the gun came in, the rifle. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I could look at that box, ma'am. Thank you. How about it, Joe? 22 caliber. <laughs> Thursday, December 22nd, 5.15 p.m. It was getting dark. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Levinson again. He'd been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood. They'd found nothing. We went down to Collis Avenue and 10th Street, service station on the corner. One nickel, Joe? No, oh, I got one. Will you watch for Thad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, City Hall. 2667, please. 2667. Crime Lab, Jones. Hi, Lee. Joe Friday. Yeah, Joe. Any sign of the Johnson kid? No, not yet. How are you coming? Finished the precipitant test. It's human blood. Yeah? Working on the blood group now. Do you know what type the Johnson boy has? Well, I didn't want to upset his mother. Thought I'd wait till the last thing we're in the neighborhood. Check with the family physician. That way you won't disturb it. Yeah, I figured on that. Uh, just a minute, Lee. Yeah. Yeah, man. Most just pulled up. Okay. Uh, Thad Brown's out here now. I'll check you later, Lee, huh? All right, Joe. All right, bye. Over this way, Joe. Gentlemen, how's it going? We just checked with Lee Jones. Yeah, I know. It's human blood. What do you think? We talked with the boy's mother, Mrs. Johnstone, found a gun missing. Yeah? Caliber's the same as the empty casing Levinson found. It's 22. You said the gun was missing? Yeah, the Johnstones were going to give it to the boys a Christmas present. They had it hidden, but it's gone. Any idea who took it? Well, I left the Christmas wrapping behind. I think it was the kid. 22 rifle, hmm? 
Nine-year-old boy. What is he going to learn? First, it's carbide cannons on the 4th of July. The city issued ordinance after ordinance. A few thousand kids around the country had to lose their eyes, fingers, hands before the parents would give us their full cooperation to outlaw them. I know what you mean. Sure you do. You and every other cop in the country became the heavies trying to clamp down on them. Tell us the same story. This time it's guns for Christmas. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but we're not sure yet. Listen, Friday. There's a city ordinance against giving a gun to a kid. You know that. Yeah, I know that. There's a missing boy and a missing gun. There's blood on the ground and an empty shell. That's enough for me. You're only going to stay with it. Something's got to break. Yeah? I hope it's not the hearts of that kid's parents. Hi, Chief. Been looking for you, Friday. What do you got, Harry? Found the gun. New twenty-two rifle. That's has been fired recently. Where'd you find it, Levinson? Back up there in that scrub oak behind the Johnstone house. Mrs. Johnstone identified it. Buckley took it down the crime lab. Thanks, Harry. Mrs. Johnstone okay? Pretty sick now. Doherty came up with something else. What's that? There's another one missing. An eight-year-old boy. 6.30 p.m. We talked with Officer Doherty about the other missing boy. He told us that his name was Stephen Morheim, eight years old. His family had just moved into the neighborhood. It seemed that no one besides the Morheim family knew that the boys played together. Mrs. Morheim told us that Stephen told her that he was going out to play and he'd be home by 6 o'clock for dinner. She told us that he was an unusually prompt boy and almost never overstayed his playtime. We got a description of the Morheim boy and put out a missing broadcast. We called the Johnstone's family doctor. He told us that Stanley's blood was type O. At 7 p.m., we talked again with Mrs. John Morheim. Are you sure Mrs. Johnstone doesn't know where the boys are? She has no idea, Mrs. Morheim. Oh, this is terrible. Just awful. I feel there's more to this thing, something you're not telling me. Well, there's no use to upset you until we know a few things for sure. Then you're holding back something. Well, now, please try not to worry, Miss Morheim. There are certain things that we're going to have to ask you, routine questions in any kind of investigation. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, ma'am. What is your boy's blood type? That's a funny question. Do you think anything's happened to him? Have you found him and you're not telling me? No, ma'am, we haven't found him, and we don't think anything's happened to him. His blood type? Yes, ma'am. I think I have it written down in Stevie's baby book. Yes, here you are. It's type O. Thank you. I wonder if I might use your phone? Yes, of course. It's in the hall. I'll be right back, Ben. Okay. City Hall. Uh, 2667, please. 2667? Crime lab, thank you. Oh, Ray, this is Joe Friday. Is Lee there? Just a minute, Joe. Take two, Lee. Right. John speaking. Checking back, Lee. Did you get the blood types on the two missing boys? Yeah, both type O. So are the stains, Joe. Type O. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke long cigarettes, give the best of long cigarettes. Give king-size Fatima. You see, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended, to give smokers a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality. Even to the appearance of the distinctive royal blue Fatima gift carton. Christmas wrapped and carefully sealed to ensure Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Remember, Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. So this Christmas, give your friends the best. Give Fatima the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Thursday, December 22nd. Still no sign of either of the missing boys. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown went back to headquarters to direct the search from there. He dispatched another detail of 50 men to aid in the hunt for the missing youngsters. 8.30 p.m. It was getting colder. The citrus growers were warned to expect a freeze. We went up the block to see Mrs. Johnstone. Her husband had quit work early and returned home. We talked with him. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. We 
still had not informed either of the families about the blood stains in the empty cartridge casing, which had been discovered in the backyard of the Johnstone home. It was more than possible that they had a right to know about our findings, but Ben and I felt there was no cause to add to the distress of the two families at this time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the blood stains in the cartridge would be of no concern to the relieved parents. At 8.40 p.m., Ben and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Morheim. Ms. Morheim, you said your husband worked at a market. Yes, he telephoned about 15 minutes ago, said he was closing up right away. He'll be here any minute. I do wish Stevie would call, come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton jacket. We'll try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. He'll be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. He and the boy are so close. I know he's terribly upset. Now, you're sure there's no place that you might have forgotten, some place where the boy might be? No, no place. No. If anything's happened to the boy, it'll just kill John. No. You sit still. I'll get it, Miss Warren. Joe? Larry. The Johnstone kid, he's been found. He's home, Sergeant. He's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No. No, he didn't. His clothes are all dirty and he's acting strange. I've never seen him like this. How do you mean, Miss Johnson? Well, he just came to the front door and said, Hello, Mom. He sat down in a chair and stared at the floor. He won't talk to his father or me. Do you mind if I talk to him? No, go ahead. I asked him about the little Moorheim boy, but he wouldn't tell me a thing. Where is he now? Right over there in the living room. Looks all right. Yes. Son. Son, this is a police officer. He wants to talk to you. Don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Stanley, look at me, son. Come on, youngster. Get your head up there. That's better. You had your mother pretty worried, you know that. You want to tell us where you've been? We should try to get him to eat a little something. You hear that, son? Want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the studio who hasn't come home. You know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too. Just like your folks were. We're going to ask you to help us find him. I killed him. I killed Steve with the twenty-two. We were only playing, but I killed him. How do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt now, isn't that it? No, he's dead. I know he's dead. The gun went off. I forgot we put bullets in there. Where is he, Stanley? I hit him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. Where did you hide him, son? In a cave up on the hill. I didn't mean it. He was my pal. Do you want to show us where, Stanley? Yes, I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. Fifteen p.m. Thursday, December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley John Stone led the way up the hill behind the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he moved the body in. His father came along with us. About 50 feet from the crest of the hill, the boy pointed to a thicket of scrub oak. There we found a small cave holding the body of Stephen Morheim. There was a single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. We covered the body. Stanley, how did it happen? I knew my folks were going to give me the gun for Christmas. I knew where it was, and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing the gun at Stephen, son? No, sir. No, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him. Tripped over that stump there, and he fell. Gun hit him in the stomach, and it went off. Well, why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth? I'm telling the truth. Yes, that's the truth. Well, I believe you, son, but why do you think you killed him? It was my gun. Stevie'd still be alive if I didn't go and get it. Should have waited till Christmas. It's all my fault. Well, where have you been all this time? In the cave with Steve. Well, what were you doing in there, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make him alive again. After a thorough investigation, Ben and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Morheim was accidental. Lieutenant Lee Jones' findings substantiated the Johnstone boy's story even to the smallest detail. 
We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Moorheim home. Mrs. Moorheim collapsed. The family doctor was called. Ben and I sat in the living room to wait for John Moorheim, the dead boy's father. Edith? Edith? Uh, Mr. Morheim? Yeah, are you the police? Yes. Well, where's Edith? Where's my wife? Has my boy come home? Have you found him? Yes, sir. Well, where is he? Steve? Stevie? Where, where's Steve? He's hurt, isn't he? Yes, sir, he is. Where is he? I want to see him. He's hurt bad, Mr. Morrow. Where is he? I want to see him. How bad? Pretty bad. He's dead. All right, if I go in. Yes, sir, if you want to. Will you go with me? Sure. Don't make it any harder on yourself, Mr. Morrow. I want to see my boy. Mr. Morheim. Just you. Listen to me, son. We got you a lot of nice things for Christmas. Everything you wanted. I got you the three new cars for the train. That one with the searchlight on it really works, son. Got you that new switch you wanted. A lot more track. Oh, now you can have a big layout. And you know that new baseball mitt we saw? I got it for you. The cowboy outfit you wanted. <laughs> Sister Morheim. Come on, you. What happened? It was an accident. He was playing with a Johnstone boy up the street. <laughs> playing with a gun. It went off. What was the other boy's name? Stanley Johnstone. It was an accident. Mr. Morheim, where are you going? I want to see that boy. We had no idea what the dead boy's father had in mind. We didn't feel that we should try to restrain him. We went along with him up the street to the Johnstone home. I'm Stevie's father. Where's your boy? I'm sorry. We bought the rifle. We were going to tell him not to use it unless his father was with him until he learned how to treat firearms. Where's your boy? Right here. Don't you come in? It's all right, Miss Johnson. You the boy that was with Stevie? Yes, sir. What's your name? Stanley. I know it wasn't your fault, Stanley. Wonder if you'd do something for me. Yes, sir. I've got a lot of nice presents for Stevie. I know he'd want you to have them. I want to give them to you Christmas Eve. Mom? I think that'd be a fine idea, son. Come on, man. Well, what's it all prove, Joe? You don't give a kid a gun for Christmas. On December 24th, 1948, a coroner's inquest was held in the county morgue, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. To get year-round thanks for the gift you give this Christmas, give cartons of Fatimas to every long cigarette smoker on your list. Christmas Fatimas in the special royal blue slip-over jacket 
make a perfect gift just as is. And to my friends who sell Fatimas, the retail dealers and the wholesale distributors all over America, to each one of you, a special season's greeting. And to everyone, a Merry Christmas. At the coroner's inquest, it was officially recorded that Stephen Morheim's death was the result of an accident. Stanley Johnstone was absolved of any legal responsibility for his friend's death. Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. This is Bob Hope. Can we steal a second? Chesterfield, Chesterfield, always win first place. That's mild or mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you smoke them. Don't forget to give Crosby for Christmas. I mean the Chesterfield Christmas carton with Bing as Papa Santa Claus. See you Tuesday. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet. Portions transcribed from Los Angeles. We the People is next with more good times on NBC. NBC.